Welcome to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point with me, Liu Xin. In this series, I dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my guests to compensate for the missing pieces of the puzzle. So join me in real time by sending me your comments or questions via the CGTN page or on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube or Weibo. If you're watching this live on the CGTN application, email me at thepointwithlx at cgtn.com. Let me know what you think. We air the Headline Buster segment on Fridays at 11 a.m. Beijing time, so do get in touch and I just might read out your comments. Today, we're going to talk about climate change as China and the United States are stepping up cooperation. First, let's take a look at some viewers' comments on this topic. From Ivan Ho, a change in U.S. administration 2024 election may derail present climate action should the politician decide to back off from the Paris Climate Agreement again. Nevertheless, China and like-minded economies need to move forward in their respective green plan. From Edwin O, I love how the Western news always have to say two things bad about China before they say one thing nice about it. When they compare pollution, they like to use absolute terms to put China on the spot. And when it comes to sustainable energy production, they like to use per capita terms to undermine China. They would do whatever for the bad China narrative. Rolling Panda. Authoritarian government causes inefficiency claimed by a country that have government torn down whatever the previous government has done in the past term. I think we know what they're talking about. The Communist Party of China has many flaws. Efficiency is actually the top of any government in the world. There is no debate. You have five-year plan and you just do it. Well, I have to say there are debates. They're just not out in the public. They are behind door closed, uh, closed door um, conversations, consultations, and all kind of opinions are channeled before the final consensus is made and crystallized in the five-year plan. So there are debates, but we are true, very efficient. Once we decide what we're going to do, we just you know, stick to the plan and do it. So many thanks to our viewers, as usual, for those comments. Please do keep them coming. And as always, criticism, always welcome. This week, the world celebrates Earth Day on April the 22nd. So today, let's talk about climate change. What steps is China taking to protect the environment? What's the significance of China and the United States issuing a joint statement on climate change? And how is media covering the story in a neutral light? Or have they framed it, intentionally or not, in a negative light? First, a bit of background. Now, the joint statement between China and the United States was issued after China's special envoy for climate change, Xie Zhenghua, and visiting U.S. special presidential envoy for climate, John Kerry, met in Shanghai on April the 15th and 16th. The statement confirms that the two countries' commitment to cooperating with each other and with other countries to tackle the climate crisis and reaffirms the two governments' commitment to the Paris Agreement, which they both signed exactly five years ago on Earth Day in 2016. The agreement's goal is to limit global warming to well below 2 degrees, preferably to 1.5 degrees Celsius, compared to pre-industrial levels. Now, China and the United States together account for about 40 percent of global emissions. By issuing the statement, the U.S. government took another step to rejoin in the global efforts. Mind that China never exited from the Paris Agreement and relevant actions. So the United States has decided to rejoin the global efforts to implement policies, measures and technologies to decarbonize and develop long-term strategies aimed at carbon neutrality, among other steps. Another major development is President Xi Jinping's speech at a virtual climate summit that was hosted by U.S. President Joe Biden starting on April the 22nd. Now, President Xi said it requires extraordinarily hard efforts for China to fulfill its commitment to moving from carbon peaking to carbon neutrality, which is a much shorter time span for China than what might take many developed countries. She also said China welcomes the return of the U.S. to multilateral governance on climate change and vowed to work with the international community, including the United States, in that regard. 
After all, it's a hopeful sign that the U.S. is engaging China on this, despite labeling China as a serious competitor on almost all other fronts. China, as one of the world's largest greenhouse gas emissions emitters, has taken both steps in recent years. For example, by 2019, carbon emission intensity in China had decreased by almost half compared with 2005, which exceeded the target China set for itself originally. Last year, China also promised to bring that level to more than 65 percent by 2030. Now, renewable energy resources have expanded rapidly. The country's installed capacity of renewable energy power generation totaled 930 million kilowatts by the end of 2020, accounting for over 40 percent of the country's total. That's according to the country's National Energy Administration in March. According to International Renewable Energy Agency's data, China ranks number one in the world in renewable energy power capacity or electricity generation by 2020. And significant improvement has been made in energy efficiency. Since 2012, energy consumption per unit of GDP has been reduced by a quarter. That's equivalent to 1.3 billion tons of standard coal. And the list goes on. Of course, China still has a long way to go. According to World Nuclear News, the International Energy Agency warned that demand for all fossil fuels is on course to grow significantly in 2021. More than 80% of that is set to come from Asia, led by China, much more than from developed economies. That, I believe, is also a result of China's robust economic recovery from the COVID-19 crisis, plus the size of its economy. On top of that, Geopolitics still gets in the way in terms of discussion on the environment. While it is still trying to project itself as the global leader in tackling climate change, the United States has adopted a very different attitude regarding Japan's decision to release radioactive wastewater into the Pacific Ocean. Despite strong objection from its neighbors and uh, from Japan's neighbors and the UN human rights experts expressing deep disappointment and warning against considerable risk risks, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken thanked Japan for its apparent efforts in a recent tweet. So fight climate change, but forget about the Pacific? What exactly is the U.S.'s message for the world? Now, back to my usual focus. How have the media covered the climate change story? Let's take a look at some recent examples from this past week at least. Now, our first example comes from the Wall Street Journal with the title, John Kerry says the U.S. will hold China accountable on climate pledges. It starts by saying U.S. climate envoy John Kerry said the Biden administration won't compromise with China on economic issues or human rights in its attempts to negotiate a deal to address climate change. Right off the bat, the story interprets the statement between the U.S. and China not as anything joined or mutual, but rather a pledge by China to do what the U.S. demands, as if China owes the U.S. But if you read further, the U.S. climate envoy actually says the climate issue is a freestanding issue. It's not for trade against the other critical differences that we have with China right now, and those have got to be channeled separately. Climate is about the survival of the planet. Channeled separately. Kerry's message is very clear. Now, climate change is climate change. Don't package it with human rights or trade or any other issue. So I wonder whether the Wall Street Journal really understood Kerry correctly or they choose to believe there are different messages in between his lines. It doesn't read that way to me. The New York Times quoted him too. On U.S.-China tensions, it quotes Kerry saying during an interview in Seoul that it's very important for us to try to keep those other things away because climate is a life or death issue in so many different parts of the world and that this is not a finger-pointing exercise of one nation alone. I think his messages are more than clear. Our next example comes from the BBC with the headline, China and the U.S. pledge climate change commitment. It's a neutral enough headline and the article itself does lay out some facts, but the head image is, guess what, a policeman wearing a mask against the smoggy backdrop 
of the Tiananmen. Beijing doesn't have blue skies or clean air every day, but is such a politically charged photo totally appropriate and absolutely necessary for a story that's supposedly non-political? The whole point of U.S.-China engagement on climate change is to screen out the political noises. The article contained certain fairness, however. It does point out both China's and the U.S.'s shortcomings. For example, that according to the Climate Action Tracker, an independent scientific analysis that tracks government climate action, China's nationally determined contributions, meaning the goal China sets for itself, is highly insufficient and are not at all consistent with holding warming to below 2 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, for the U.S., the tracker gives the worst rating of critically insufficient. It also reminds readers that the U.S. was absent from climate negotiations during President Donald Trump's term of office. The article quotes a Greenpeace interviewee who described the joint statement between China and the United States as positive, which is positive, but China's efforts and ambitious targets are nowhere to be seen. If I had not laid out the background for you now, would you have walked away with the impression that China has at least been doing some things? I doubt it. Finally, a video on YouTube called How the U.S. Fell Behind China in the Fight Against Climate Change, posted by CNBC at the end of last year. It gives a rather comprehensive picture of China's climate efforts. At the start of the video, it outlines the problem that China is facing, although I would remind people China's air is not always so smoggy and not everywhere so smoggy. Take a look. It's not that people didn't know that pollution in China was a problem. Since around 2006, China has been the global leader in annual carbon emissions, surpassing the U.S. But seeing the images alongside the data drove it home. The country was in bad shape. The video then goes on to present the work that China has done in the past years. So we've seen the last decade an incredible rate of growth in China of clean tech, pushed in no small measure by air quality concerns, but equally pushed by the idea of China being a global marketer for clean alternatives. The country has become the world's largest manufacturer of solar panels, lithium-ion batteries, and electric vehicles. China buys over half of the world's new electric cars and nearly all of the world's electric buses. So when Trump withdrew the U.S. from the Paris Agreement, China became the signatory with the most economic clout and a de facto climate leader. On the other side, the video also quotes an expert who explains the challenges to shift China's energy focus away from coal. Half of China's coal is burned in heavy industry directly. China's factories produce half of the world's steel and cement. And Unfortunately, right now, we don't have readily available alternatives that are cost effective. So that's going to require China to expend massive investments and efforts in order to develop cleaner alternatives for industries such as green hydrogen. Well, people love the Tiananmen Square, don't they? <laughs> anyway, having critiqued these stories, I want to say it's not about international public opinion or geopolitics that China is fighting climate change. Nobody wants better clean and, and better, you know, clean air, blue sky more than the Chinese people ourselves. After all, it's about the happiness of every one of us living here. We'll take a quick break and uh, we'll be back right after that and I'll be talking to three experts about this topic. Stay with me. Welcome back to Headline Buster brought to you by The Point with me, Li Xin, and I would like to introduce the three of my guests for the half of uh, discussion that we're going to have. They are Wu Changhua, Executive Director of uh, Professional Association for China's Environment, Thomas Gale, President of Childwise International Corporation, and Rick Garson, CEO and founder of VX Entertainment. Welcome to all three of you to uh, Headline Buster. Now, uh, Ms. Wu, let me go to you. 
uh, as we are just uh, hours away after President uh, Xi delivered a speech during the uh, Leader Summit on Climate where he not only talked about lofty goals but also briefed the world on what China has committed itself to do and he was talking about extraordinarily hard efforts that China has committed itself to take from its carbon peaking to carbon neutrality basically in 30 years time and for Western developed economies that's uh, almost half a century so help us understand exactly what this extraordinarily uh, hard efforts mean by President Xi. As the president pointed out, and, uh, China has made a serious commitment to uh, reaching uh, capping or peaking uh, of its emission before 2030 and then carbon neutrality before 2060. So we literally have this three decades apart uh, when China has to uh, you know, peak its emission first and then quickly uh, decline its emissions actually almost to, to zero, car to carbon neutral actually by 2060. Uh, that's going to be a very difficult journey. It's about the cost, it's about the fundamental transformation of the infrastructure, the energy infrastructure, and the country, the people has to bear the cost, right? right? And uh, we cannot really rely on others. Uh, of course, we could say we could invest in renewable energy. Yes, it's the investment. Right, we need money, and uh, there are many priorities of the country. The government has to manage it for the you know benefit of its people. But somehow, the energy transformation is pretty much taking much of the country's resources in order to deliver this transformation. So the burden and the task actually itself is very hard, yeah. and uh, I, I I'm not sure the international community really gets it at this point. At yeah. this point. Okay, let me go to Gail. Um, Mr. Gail, do you um, think that the international community is getting the, the point of how much of an effort China is, uh, you know, challenging itself to, and China is committing itself to, or do you think it is, you know, just another country fighting climate change? I think that the that the world really doesn't understand how much China has done already. I mean, I applaud President Xi's efforts over the last ten years to substantially reduce the environmental impact in the in the country and the the huge effort going forward. I mean, a big we talked about this on the show before that the um, nuclear energy will be the major producer of electricity in the future. So China is making huge commitments in, in that area for safe nuclear um, power. Um, they do, unfortunately, because of the energy consumption demands, they're going to add as much coal generation as the United States has in the next um, eight years, but then phase that out over the next 30 years. So it's a, it's a balancing act on meeting the present needs and then building towards the, towards the future. But I think that again um, in the last three um, five-year plans that China has put um, energy and and environmental um, uh, reduction as one of the key uh, five points in in the plan so I think they don't get enough credit um, and I think they're doing some amazing things and I'm glad the United States is back on track to hold up their end so I think between with the with the summit we just had, it was 60% of the um, greenhouse gas emitters were participating, you know, in that conference and have made the commitment to try to be carbon neutral by 2050, 2060. Mm. So we're on the right track to actually do things mm. and have more action than just rhetoric. Okay. Rick, what is your assessment of uh, the kind of uh, momentum that seems to be gathering pretty fast, pretty recent, since recently, and especially since uh, the United States has made a high profile return to the, to the Paris Climate Agreement? No, uh, thanks for having me. And I think it's it's absolutely it's great. I mean, you know, look, the bottom line is that China can't do it with the without the states, and the states can't do it without China. And it's been for me, being here, it's been an unbelievable turnaround with the, you know, how they control the the air pollution, and everybody should learn from here. But just also with the new administration, is a new outlook. You know, and they have to, everybody's got to work together to make it happen. And just for example, you know, for the upcoming Olympics, uh, 2022, is that 
China and the IOC are the first, the first country in the world, the first Olympics to build this, this uh, uh, CO2 all natural refrigeration skating rink in the only new venue built for the Olympics. So there's zero GWP outlook output. So it's a, the a extremely environmental friendly uh, rink and the, the first to do this. So they're making real efforts and, and uh, it's getting better daily. Rick, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Rick, I understand. You're based in China. You're speaking us from within yeah. China, and you have first-hand experience. Yeah. Help us understand. What has been your experience, personal experience? My, my, my experience has been. You know, I mean, when I first came here, I mean, it was kind of uh, during the winter days, and it was really scary. I mean, you couldn't. You know, I wasn't. It was. When really, was that? You know, a lot of. Uh, I say the the. I first came here. You know, for the my first trip was for the 2008 Summer Olympics, mm. but then you know it, and then I moved here four years ago. But the thing is, prior to that, it was extremely there were really bad days. But then again, I remember in California, standing on the beach in Santa Monica and looking east. You know that the air was all yellow; you couldn't see the mountains. Here, you know, it, I think pollution has dropped by. 30, 40 percent. And now, you know, at night you can see the stars here in Beijing. You can see the mountains. I mean, it's been a drastic, drastic change for the better. And mm -hmm. it's been, you know, un unbelievable to see that how China has said they're going to do it and they do it. Where, as I love America, America's a great country, but they can't make up their minds, as you know. So, uh, but it's great. It's been, it's mm -hmm. really been amazing to see the change. And then taking the lead and also like for these Olympics where the, all the world will be watching again, China and, you know, by building this, this new ice skating rink, the ribbon, the speed skating rink with my business associate guy Cotier, you know, it's the first, first, uh, natural refrigeration mm. skating rink, you know, in yeah. China. Yeah. So, um, Changhua, let me go to you. Um, what happened exactly over the past few years that things really took a market term for the better? And uh, how, how solid is the gain that we're seeing? How solid is the changes that we're seeing? I mean, f since the beginning of this year, for, for instance, the air in Beijing has, has been less than satisfactory, I would say. Uh I think that the biggest step the country has ever taken to, I would call it a war on air pollution, right? And uh, that was declared by back in 2013. Uh, so it literally takes a united front of the whole country uh, addressing these issues there, uh, starting with the coal, right? Uh, fossil fuel burning. And uh, because you talk about air pollution, pollution, as long as we know where the sources of the pollution are, then we can figure out how to address them, uh, So, which is a good thing. That's why we know where the pollutants come from, uh, you know, coal-fired power plants, transportation, construction site, whatever. So literally the government to pull the country, you know, everyone together to address those issues. Then you started to see new laws coming uh, together, uh, amendment to the laws that really started to have laws with the teeth meaning clear liabilities mm -hmm. and the penalties and of course incentives there as well and the monitoring definitely coming on board the other thing actually uh, with the digital technology ai technology coming on board so literally as an ordinary citizen just using your mobile phone smartphone you take a photo the AI, ai application basically can tell you immediately the you know the the pm 2.5 you know the, the the concentration of that that particular moment actually mm. so with all the things happening now so everyone suddenly it's not just the government right the government the business but also individuals the general public started really participating into this process because everybody cares about air quality and about their health yeah. right so i think that that's the sort of the nature of the issue why we witnessed that the progress is made so far yeah. as i said it's really a united front in the country to yeah. fight air pollution Hmm. Uh, Thomas, how big of a deal is it that uh, President Xi um, joined, accepted the invitation to participate in the Leader Summit on Climate hosted by President Biden and made a speech there? Uh, do you think the two countries can really isolate this case, this, this you know, engagement from 
um, the plethora of other issues they might have. Let's not forget the U.S. Congress just passed some kind of an act, you know, trying to contain China from a comprehensive perspective. But on climate, it seems that they are determined to channel it separately, in the words of Kerry. Uh, President Xi was very um, uh, quick in doing the acceptance, did a beautiful speech to the um, uh, to the leadership. So I think that shows the willingness of both countries to be able to work very effectively together. And I think that is, as Rick said before, that's what it's about. It's about working together to solve a problem that affects everybody. Pollution, respect, no borders. So water pollution, air pollution, um, climate change affects everyone, all of humanity, anywhere on the, in the globe. So we have to work together to be able to do these things and, and make that happen. Let's hope it holds. Finally, before we go, we have Absolutely. a, yeah, we have a, a viewer comment uh, to share with all of us. So let's take a look at that. And it, it, it comes in um, in the form of uh, a comment. Today, these Western countries moves their manufacturing industries to smaller and developing nations and are now accusing them of polluting and contributing to global warming. Uh, I want to give the op from um, Gualza Suter. I want to give the opportunity to Rick probably to say something about this. Yeah, Rick, do you have a comment on this? Being really simple about it is like everybody's, you know, you got to recognize it. We got to fix it, and it takes everybody to do it together. You know, and you know, and with now with the new administration and President Xi, they will work together. And, and I jokingly say, you know, China's like really showing by example. And I'm saying that you know that it's red China is going to green China, you know, because it's really showing by example how to do it. And America's <laughs> got to America's got to wake up <laughs> and catch up. Yeah. OK, let's see. You it's it's funny. Yeah. Green China. We yeah. all like that. But China will be red yes. in the heart. <laughs> forever. That's right. Red, okay. is, red is forever. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. Many thanks to my guests, uh, Wu Changhua, Thomas Gale, and Rick Garson. That's been a very interesting discussion. And uh, Thank you so uh, much. many thanks to our viewers for having followed our discussion. I hope you uh, learned something or enjoyed the conversation as well as usual. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Lushin in Beijing. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next Friday as uh, on our Headline Buster segment. You've got the point. Bye for now.